Hey guys, we're finally um, getting to finish this hypertrophy series. It's been the most fun. Uh, it's taken me a lot of work and it's a lot of time, but I'm super excited about getting this out to you guys. So anyway, without me sitting here rambling, let's go over the part two of the hypertrophy series. We're going to talk about what stimulates muscle hypertrophy. How does muscle hypertrophy work? Let's find out. This week, we're going to learn about the mechanisms, so what we used to think, um, mechanical tension, going to failure, maximum effort, barbell velocity, compensatory acceleration, like what causes you know mu muscle hypertrophy. You know, and then we're going to learn some of the science, the signaling pathway. I'm not going to try to overwhelm you too much. But, and then we're going to talk a little bit about hyperplasia versus hypertrophy. So here's what we used to think. I mean, I literally wrote a book, I think maybe um, like 2016, maybe. I wrote a book uh, about hypertrophy, and it's still out there. It's still a hypertrophy book, uh, hypertrophy book and it's called Mass Chacked. And uh, in that book, I talked about mechanical tension, metabolic stress, and muscle damage. And so then at that point, we thought that those were the three main um, triggers of muscle hypertrophy. So let's go over each of those and then um, I'll tell you what the actual truth is. So mechanical tension uh, definition. This is uh, in reference to mechanically induced tension produced by force, production, and stretch with the combination being optimal. So um, it, basically when you lift something heavy, you cause uh, types of tension or compression on uh, a muscle cell, muscle fiber. So anyway, so uh, think concentric force production and eccentric stretching of muscles. So when we're pushing, there's going to be some compression. There's going to be force on the um, muscle uh, fibers. But then when we're like lowering something, there's going to be a stretching, which is that's the tension actually. So resistance training disturbs the integrity of skeletal muscle causing um, mechanochemically transduced molecular and cellular responses in myofibers and satellite cells. As you can tell, this is the complicated view of, of what all is going on. Um, and don't let all this freak you out. So we're, um, you know, this is not a, a biochem class, but I just wanted you to see just how, and this is, that is very simply put too. It's way more complicated than that, but it kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. So upstream upstream signaling is thought to occur through a cascade of events that involve growth factors, cytokines, stretch activated channels, and focal adhesion complexes. Uh, downstream process is regulated via the a AKT mTOR pathway. So um, through phos phosphate, uh, acid. So passive tension from eccentric contractions are fiber type specific. So type 2 fast twitch. So when you're doing like um, say an RDL, uh, the good thing about the hypertrophy there, it's going to be predominantly uh, type 2 fast twitch fibers. It's caused by primarily by the collagen content in the extracellular matrix and the titan. So like the, the elements that help to resist stretch um, they're going to be a big cause of a lot of the hypertrophy um, and a cause of the extra amounts of force that's able to be produced in the eccentric contraction up to sometimes 120 to 130 time percent uh, as much as the concentric contraction. So metabolic stress, you know, that's the pump. You know, that's when we, um, when the bodybuilders like do a, thousand sets of 20 and they get the big pump and they think that they've had growth right away which they don't but you know they look cool for the moment but metabolic stress it it relies on anaerobic glycolysis for atp production which, which results in the subsequent buildup of metabolites such as like lactate hydrogen ion inorganic phosphate creatine and others it's the pump most bodybuilders chase so um, it's also a great way of, of rehabbing too. See, like when you people use the blood flow restriction, they're re really relying heavily on metabolic stress. But in a minute, you're going to find out how 
all everything we're talking about is pretty much the same thing. So muscle damage, um, definition, localized damage to muscle tissue. Damage can be specific to just a few um, macro molecules of tissue or result in large tears in the sarcolemma, the basal uh, lamina and supportive connective tissue and induces injury to contractile elements and the, the cytoskeleton. So that's from Schoenfeld, 2002. Uh, Brad Schoenfeld is like... Uh, one of the world leaders in hypertrophy research. So, uh, basically, causes inflammatory response, which is the neutrophils. They, you know, they send a signal to the macrophages, send a signal to the cytokines, which signals the growth factors, and then the satellite cells. And that's what that's what they thought that muscle damage was a huge part of um, hypertrophy, and it definitely is a part of it. So. It deforms the membranes, particularly the T-tubules that we've talked about in the first one, um, and leading to a disruption of calcium homeostasis, and consequently damage because of tearing of membranes and or opening of stretch activated channels. So, and this is probably, you know, like uh, the reason why a lot of type 2 fibers is when you're doing, you know, um, like lengthening, the eccentric phase, especially something where you're loading it as it's lengthening, you know, you're causing a lot of disruption in, in the calcium. And it's going to be an influx of that. And so that is predominantly what um, attra is attracted to the myosin um, heavy chains, which is where basically that is where the type, two, you know, that's what makes a muscle fiber type 2, type 1, type 2X. So um, that's just my theory. I'm not, you know, a um, biochem major, so. All right, so now let's talk about what is really happening. So what are the mechanisms? Mechanical tension is the thing. Uh, and like mechanical tension, metabolic stress, and muscle damage, they're all related. They're all now looked at as the, basically the same thing. <clears throat> now, some movements cause more damage than others, of course like an RDL and muscle damage is not necessarily a good thing and so like um, if you feel being super super sore is what causes you to be jacked it's probably not true because it's what it's going to do is going to prevent you from you know having the frequency that you're going to need so but we'll go over that in part three so comes down to here's what here's what you need to know about what causes um, maximum amount of hypertrophy you got to you got to lift weights with a maximum effort. You're going to have to lift um, with a maximum barbell velocity, and the barbell has to slow down for maximum hypertrophy uh, to actually take place um, because it's got to get close to proximity of failure, and that slow bar path is when the high threshold motor units are recruited uh, that's just the size principle when things are super easy the small ones are recruited so when we when we walk around all day you know the the you know the low threshold motor units are recruited but then when we lift massive amounts of weight you're going to get the high threshold motor units which are going to be attached to a greater number of muscle fibers so now compensatory acceleration i definitely want to touch on that and I've heard that term so much in my lifetime. Uh, Fred Hatfield, Dr. Fred Hatfield, um, God rest his soul, he made that term popular, and Louis Simmons uh, used it a great deal as well. And what compensatory acceleration basically says is that you, when you're lifting a weight, especially during the concentric phase, you're going to want to push it as fast as you can throughout the entire movement. Now, when you bench press, inevitably the majority of you out there listening to this slow down at the top so that is not compensatory acceleration so the only way to do that is by pushing as hard as you can as fast as you can throughout the entire range of motion so when it's light it's probably going to pull you off the bench or if you're squatting it's going to pop up off your shoulders if you do it correctly and if you don't well then you're not going to get maximum amounts of hypertrophy um, you're also not going to get a lot of other benefits that we'll talk about you know that we've already talked about in other uh, episodes so muscle damage actually slows the process from deformed membranes particularly the t-tubules leading to a disruption in the calcium homeostasis so that is not a good thing because when that happens you can't uh even if you choose to lift when there's 
a high amounts of muscle damage, you can't produce enough force to recruit the fibers necessary to get hypertrophy. So not a whole lot is going to happen other than probably just cause more damage. So it's the balance between muscle failure, muscle damage, and frequency. So you want to go as close as you can to failure without going over and creating too much damage. So you can do, you, you can lift often enough to one, get the maximum amounts of hypertrophy and two, to be able to uh, perform movements enough times and enough with enough frequency to get really good at it. So like say for a weightlifter, like we have to snatch and clean and jerk as often as possible. Uh, squatting is important, pulls are important. So if, if I kill an athlete on Monday and they can't lift again until Thursday or Friday, that is a bad thing in a sport that requires lots of practice. So uh, the art comes with the balancing of going as hard as you can without going too far to create so much damage. So, uh, a barbell has to slow down for maximum amounts of cross bridges over here. The, like what, what I'm trying to say is that most of you know the sliding filament theory where the myosin you know, grabs the active site of the actin, performs that power stroke, and then causing, you know, causing everything to shorten, which is like basically pulling. And, um, you know, without the maximum amount of that happening, then you're not going to be able to create the maximum amount of hypertrophy. So um, it has to slow down. If it's going too fast, the, the maximum amount of myosin heads cannot grab the maximum amount of actin. So uh, that has to happen. So we, you can't always lift super fast. It can't be like and expect muscle to grow. So uh, that's where Jamoir comes in. Um, in in the in part three, I'm going to get into detail about how to actually create the ma the maximum amount of hypertrophy. I'm also going to talk to you about creating uh, the most optimal amount depending on the type of athlete you are. But um, for maximum amount, if you're a bodybuilder listening right now, I'll go ahead and give you a tip. You know, if you're list, you know, if you're lifting 70% of your one RM, you're going to want to see 40 to 60% of velocity loss to actually, you know, get the maximum amount of hypertrophy. However, you know, the with that comes adaptations that athletes who are faster don't necessarily want. So, whether high reps with moderate rate weight or lower reps with heavy weight the same minimum threshold uh, stands true so if you're squatting and you're the average person you're going to fail somewhere around 0.3 so you're going to want to get somewhere close to that 0.3 as close as you can without getting to it and actually getting failure and cr creating too much damage so that's that's where the magic is but that's also where it's great to have a tool like a gym aware um, RS or a flex unit to make sure you're you're seeing enough velocity loss to get the hypertrophy you're after without going too far and creating too much damage. So um, the same number of high threshold motor units and the same number of cross bridges, just not the same synchronization. Meaning when you're using super lightweight, say 30, 40%, and you're doing, I don't know, 20, 30 reps, whatever you're doing, you're going to get the same amount of high threshold. You're going to recruit the same motor units and you're going to get the same number of cross bridges. They just don't happen at the same time, meaning like it's a longer fatiguing process. Now, if I'm lifting 85%, pretty much from the minute I start, I'm recruiting all those high threshold motor units due to the amount of force I'm having to overcome. But if I'm going light at first, it's going to be low threshold and slowly you're going to get uh, if you look at the picture to the right the recruitment you're going to get the small then the moderate and then the high but at different points whereas when you're lifting heavy you get them all together and that synchronization causes the coordination that we're after to lift massive weights meaning like that you're going to get really strong by lifting heavy weights uh, for smaller amounts of repetitions versus lifting lighter weights for as many repetitions as you can. Both create the same amount of hypertrophy, but one gets you strong. However, the one that does, you know, the low weight for high amounts of reps, that's going to get you better at uh, muscular endurance. Um, and we're going to go over that more in part three. 
All right, I'm going to try to be as simple as I can with this because if not, I'm going to blow my own mind. So let's, uh, let's this is the signaling process. The anap There's like three different pathways that y you don't need to, but it's going to be familiar. The, there's the anabolic pathway, there's the catabolic pathway, and then there's inhibitors. So the anabolic pathway is the one that you've probably heard of. It's the mammalian target of rapamycin slash mTOR. That's what you're going to hear people say, mTOR, or specifically the P13K, AKT, mTOR pathway. Um, and if you look over here, I've kind of... Um, giving you a diagram this is for this is actually from um, one of the papers that my one of my professors helped to write and so as you can see like you know you different receptors you know there's going to be like a mechanical receptor where you know when they feel some type of uh, stress when you're lifting weights um, which could be costumers it could be the, the filament mTOR autophagy cascade I mean um, and as you can see in in the in my little chart from McCarthy on um, ESSER 2010 you know these are the receptors that are around the cell wall and something happens whether it's anabolic um, where it's IGF-1 testosterone maybe even lactate from metabolic stress maybe could be some of the uh, causes I mean some of the uh, receptors along the cell wall that are activated which starts the signaling process uh, and for Hypertrophy, mTOR is the main, uh, is thought to be the main uh, cascade or the main pathway for hypertrophy. And so these are just all these proteins that are, that are in the cell that uh, they're basically called signaling proteins. And one triggers the other, triggers the other, triggers the other. So um, also, to, you know, to the catabolic pathway is the, you know, that is going to be the, um, it's over here, the nuclear factor, um, kappa B, or the NFKB FOXO pathway. The, you know, there has to be both. There cannot all, you know, when you see, for example, someone in an advertisement saying that they experienced, you know, 50% muscle protein synthesis, um, which means nothing, or even they say 150%, because what you got to know, too, is, is what about protein degradation, and it's the balance between the two that's going to equal hypertrophy, so if you have the same amount of degradation, nothing happens, which is why it's important to get your rest and to make sure that you're eating enough protein and even enough, um, enough carbohydrates to fuel yourself to be able to produce this, this muscle and to be able to produce these proteins required to, to grow. You know, also be you're also going to get amino acids are going to be coming in here too because they're going to be needed, you know, in the nucleus to create, you know, new proteins. So, um, uh, also, oh, I don't want to forget myostatin too. Also referred to as growth and differentiating factor eight. Uh, it's it is a it is an inhibitor of muscle growth, and so that's why people love you know. Um, myostatin inhibitors because what happens if you inhibit myostatin you can just get huge or you've seen those pictures of the big cows that just get ridiculously muscular but also um, not only will muscle grow but so will cancer and all the other things that we don't want to grow so it's important to have myostatin um, because you don't want things just growing out of control I also wanted to mention gene expression you know that's the the, the P13K AKT mTOR signaling pathway eventually ends in the nucleus. And so then a sequence of DNA goes through the process of transcription, forming mRNA. And mRNA, we've all heard this in biology, but and then the mRNA leaves the nucleus and binds with the ribosome and the cytoplasm, and then boom, protein synthesis takes place, and that's called translation. So here's a little diagram of that. Uh, I hope my anatomy and physiology professor is happy so I struggled through that but we got through it so here are my final thoughts sarcoplasmic or myofibril uh, hypertrophy the sarcoplasmic and myofibril hypertrophy take place both take place but what comes first so in um, a lot of you if anybody has watched Andy Galpin's um, he had the three-part series on hypertrophy a lot of this is coming a lot of this part is coming from him but however, there's going to be, as you can see, if you've listened to both, there's already some things that have changed even since then. But as you can see, like there, some people think that, you know, the myofibrils 
within the muscle fibers grow first. And then that forces more sarcoplasmic uh, hypertrophy. Or some people think that um, sarcoplasmic happens and then the cell swells and in turn allowing for the myofibrils to grow. So whichever, you know, no one, we don't know yet, um, but in this is um, this is straight from um, Andy Galvin's Dr. Galvin's um, YouTube. Is it Roberts in 2020? They they came on a little on, on the thoughts that probably the sarcoplasm happens first, and then the myofibril happens second. So you know, still lots of research to be done. But both are going to take place. And like before, you think sarcoplasmic. Um, hypertrophy is a bad thing remember that also includes like the um titan the nebulous nebulous um the uh, myosin the actin um there's some sorry those are the myofibril but like the titan the nebulin there's other um contractile or units that are actually there to hold you know like nebulin holds actin in place titan holds myosin in place and both help to resist stretch, and both are particularly important for elasticity. So, if you're a sprinter or a weightlifter, that's very important. So, those that type of hypertrophy is important too. Plus, you know the metabolic improvements that you'll get from having um, sarcoplasmic growth. So, um, wrapping it up, if you want to lift weights, uh, if you want to get maximum hypertrophy, especially maximum myofibril hypertrophy lift weights with a maximum effort lift with maximum velocity get as close to failure uh, as often as possible but go heavy going heavy makes you stronger lifting light weights to failure uh, increases muscular endurance and using a gym wear allows you to monitor um, that to ensure that you're getting what you're after so if you are doing light weights to failure uh, in hopes of getting more, you know, getting jacked, but also getting more muscular endurance. You're going to want to make sure that the barbell actually does slow down enough to create as many cross bridges between myosin and actin as possible. Uh, if you're wanting to get strong and, you know, explosive, then um, it's important that you're using gym wear to make sure that you're only getting enough velocity loss uh, to you know, 20%, maybe 30%. And you're not going past that, so you're not creating a lot of damage, so you can lift more often. So, And making sure that you're in the correct zones. Because if you think you're doing 85%, but the bar is moving at 0.6 meters per second, you're not. And so, like, uh, it's a way of, like, I like I like using velocity more than I like percentages because I work with a younger population. These college kids get stronger like that. Like, for example... Uh, Ruby Shepard, my one of my top girls, she has gone from clean and jerking 85 kilograms a year ago, which is uh, what is that, 187 pounds, to 115 kilograms in one year, which is 253 pounds. It's almost a, a 50 pound jump. So if we just went up by percentages, that would mean that half the time she would be lifting and nothing would be happening because it wouldn't be enough for stimulus. So. It's important to monitor to ensure that you're doing the type of, of training that is conducive to your own personal goals. If you have any questions, uh, email me at Travis at uh, And for all of you listening, get ready because I can promise you in the final one, you're going to get what you're after. We're going to tell you best practices. And uh, in that, we'll differ quite a bit probably from Andy. Um, discuss things have changed since he put his stuff out. So, for example, like the, you know, the whole muscle damage, metabolic stress, and um, and uh, mechanical tension, those things are, you know, not as big of a deal as more just mechanical tension, and that they're all just parts of that. So, um, anyway, we'll get into that next time. Oh, I will say before I go, these are some of the references that I've used, and. You might want to look. This, this, this is some good reading. So a lot of times research papers are not the most fun things to read through. But if you love getting jacked like I do, then it was fun. So thanks.